Welcome to the Immigration.ca live stream series. My name is Andrea and I'm here with immigration lawyer Colin Singer. Colin is managing partner of Immigration.ca. Colin is also managing partner of Global Recruiters of Montreal, our in-house employment search consulting enterprise. Our main topic today is going to be how to find a job in Canada. Thank you very much for bearing with us. We just had a, a, a small technical error, so we're going to continue right now. So before we get started, uh, We'll quickly mention express entry draws. Uh, the last express entry draw was on March 1st, so the CRS score was 434. So we do anticipate another express entry draw shortly. So Colin, I mean... Yeah, we've been uh, obviously a, a three-week period since the last draw. Uh, we've seen healthy uh, numbers in each draw for the beginning of the year. Uh, declining CRS score, so our fingers are crossed. Uh, maybe there'll be a draw today. Uh, it's happened right. before where the government has uh, held a draw on a Thursday or even a Friday. So we've got uh, a couple of hours left in the week and uh, we'll be watching and waiting. Right. So let's head in today to today's topic, which is uh, how to find a job from outside Canada. A big challenge for many individuals, yes. obviously. Right. So, I mean, those applying under Express Entry, there's a two main classes, the Federal Skilled Worker Program as well as the Skilled Trades Program. So obviously... Uh, we well, I mean, uh, those are the two bigger uh, categories that we obviously want to cover. Uh, we're certainly... What we're going to talk about today also includes uh, individuals applying under provincial uh, nomination programs under Express Entry. Uh, or the Canadian Experience class. So, I mean, if you're in the Canadian Experience class, you're hopefully working in Canada, and this has a limited application uh, for you. But uh, the, the broad categories of federal skilled worker, talk to our viewers on uh, recap what we've talked about during our last live stream. What are the main categories? How, how does the system work in terms of coding your occupation? Okay, so one of the ways, well, one of to qualify under Express Entry, you need to have one year full-time work experience under a qualifying occupation. So in order to determine if you have a qualifying occupation, you need to go to the NOC code, which is a National, Occup National Occupational Classification. So there's A, B, and 0 that qualify. So NOC 0 occupations are, for example, managerial occupations. Uh, NOC A, that would be those occupations requiring university degrees. Right. And then there's NOCB. So those would be uh, occupations that require, for example, a college degree. Or right. In, in a summary sense, uh, for a layman's uh, description, the A occupations are more or less the professional positions. Lawyers, accountants, doctors, architects, engineers, and other professional types requiring uh, a degree of education. Uh, and then there's the the B occupations, again, are the technical and skilled trades. Mm -hmm. Anyone who's going in the uh, skilled trades category, their occupation would be coded under one of the larger B categories of occupations. You can find all of this uh, under a really great tool that we use. Uh, it's the uh, tool that we refer to in our last live stream. Yes. We're going to include a link uh, in our uh, today's presentation, once it's uploaded, we will include a link uh, on YouTube and I think on Facebook as well. So you'll have access to a wonderful tool that gives you an overview of the descriptions uh, of uh, the various occupations. Again, when you're applying for express entry immigration to Canada and you're going in un under the uh, either the federal uh, skilled or the, uh, the trades occupations, uh, really, you know, it, it doesn't preclude you from looking for positions that are uh, slightly different than your background. Exactly. You know, it, you're not bound to finding a job <clears throat> that is going to, you know, exactly replicate the application that you're submitting under Express Entry. What we're talking about is how to practically find a job. Obviously, it has to be related uh, to what you're going to be submitting your application under. Uh, because that's what you're most employable under. Uh, so what we're doing is we're giving people some perspective uh, on the, the number of uh, occupations uh, that are covered in this broad category, 347, um, and how to go about actually looking for the 
uh, description uh, on what it takes to get employed, yeah. the education you generally need. But when you're actually putting practice uh, into operation, uh, you don't need to be worried that you're only looking for positions that match the, the application that you've uploaded to the express entry system or that you're going to uh, uh, plan to upload. So it, it doesn't need to be so rigidly tied. Uh, because when you go into the system, that the, the tool that we've been referring to, yes. there's many sub-occupations that are classified. And you can go and look in many of the, the various sub-occupations. So we don't want people to be so uh, rigidly tied to the application description that they're preparing. They can enlarge the, uh, the scope of occupations that they're going to try to consider uh, for employment purposes. For employment purposes, let's talk about one of the most important parts of this process. So that would be your CV, your resume. So both your digital one as well as the physical copy that you'll be creating. That you could obviously send a scanned copy by email. You know, one doesn't. You know, they both are important. So when you're looking for uh, a great application, you want to have, of course. A LinkedIn profile. We, we, we often refer to the digital online version uh, really by the, your LinkedIn profile. And there's some fabulous tools out there. There's uh, these, these publications called uh, Dummy Guides. They're, they're, they're a great publication uh, and you can find an excellent product uh, for how to make a, a LinkedIn uh, online persona and there's an excellent dummy guide uh, for specifically for your LinkedIn profile. We like we we refer people to that. Uh, of course, when we're preparing uh, digital um, uh, applications and, and online versions and, and written, we also uh, prepare uh, a, a LinkedIn profile for all our applicant clients. Uh, so, just just summarizing, really the important elements of the uh, written version. Okay. Let's talk about the important elements. Uh, what goes on top of a CV? Well, that would be your name and your contact details. It's important to, to include the contact details. Uh, many people just put their name, uh, you know, an email address, and a telephone number. Yeah. You don't need your, your uh, no. civic city address uh, or wherever you're living. Uh, you don't need to put that on the top, but you surely want to have your, your email ID. Yes. Let's talk to them about an important email ID consideration. Yeah, just make sure your, e your email ID is short, concise, and then obviously don't put too many numbers at the end. If you can make it your name, that would be great. Uh, but obviously, make sure that you know, an employer is good. That's the first thing they're going to see. So make sure that it's something that... Something appropriate. Yes. What we want you to take away from this particular short descriptive is don't put inappropriate email IDs. Uh, as part of your application process. If you have an email ID that is what we will call inappropriate, uh, it, it's, it's, it's not a good way to start off your, your job search. So ditch uh, email IDs that are uh, inappropriate uh, and you can go online and find out what is an appropriate email ID and what is not. Uh, make it really simple. Have it tied to your name, if possible. Your name and uh, perhaps a year of birth, uh, whatever the uh, the situation uh, might hold. Uh, and and again, at the top of your resume, uh, your contact details really clearly laid out. Uh, some of the resumes that we prepare have an opening statement, uh, a profile. We call it a profile. Uh, what you have done and what you can do for the employer. Now. For every job you're going to apply for, you're going to tailor make yes. your profile right. to that particular position. Obviously, you, you're going to have a range of positions that you're looking to apply for, and uh, you're going to want to tailor make your profile opening statement. It's not mandatory, but we often do include a nice short uh, profile. Uh, from there, you've got your education, uh, obviously with your most current uh, accomplishments. Uh, then followed by your work experience, we use the chronological. Or the reverse. So your most recent at the top, and then follow, so from most recent to least recent. So again, short descriptions of uh, your work experience. Very important to use forceful verb descriptions. Right. So 
uh, use one word, start off each sentence, we like to do this, where you start off each description with a, uh, a, an impactful verb, uh, managed, uh, you know, all of these types of description uh, where, you, where you're using a verb that describes what you've done, you begin each sentence. Uh, again, what we just talked about earlier, very briefly, you want to tailor make, it's not one resume for, for every single position. Exactly. So it needs to be tailored to each job you're applying for. Because obviously that shows that you know, you've gone through and you've, you've researched the company, you've researched the position, and you took the time to tailor your experiences accordingly to the job. Right. Uh, in terms of going about the types of positions that you'll be looking for, we, we look to research companies by broad industry. So there's a number of tools in Canada where you can uh, identify uh, broad industries uh, and you want to be approaching companies uh, in your industry. Now, each company, you want to put the time, look at the hiring trends that your particular employer that you're looking to approach has, has been uh, undergoing. Uh, you'll get a sense of where they're headed sometimes. There's a lot of useful information uh, on a company's website. Uh, you'll be able to see positions that might be currently open. Uh, you'll be able to take a look at uh, perhaps a, an industry a direction where they're headed and you'll be able to gauge whether this is a, a, an up and coming, an up and coming uh, potential employment opportunity. Um, let's talk about hiring managers. Again, okay. it's not good to uh, direct your messages and your, your applications to the personnel department. That, that generally doesn't go very far. So if you can identify a hiring manager, this is a bit more strategic, it's a bit more direct because the person who's going to be ultimately making a decision uh, is, is who you want to be contacting. Uh, what we like to do, and, and I, 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 I certainly emphasize this with our search consultants, is that uh, you want to contact phone by phone wherever possible. More difficult, uh, how do you maximize your chances to reach a hiring manager by phone? You want to do this early in the day. Earliest part of your day, some, some hiring managers, you know, many people are, are in the office by 7 o'clock, 7.30, 8 o'clock. That's the time you want to try to get through the phone, get into their personal phone mail, call them, and if you're lucky to reach them, that's golden. And the key is a 40-second introduction conversation. Whatever you want to uh, convey, you need to practice this, prepare a script, and you need to be able to, to summarize everything you're looking to achieve in a 40-second phone call. If you reach the hiring manager, and that's golden if you can do that, it does happen occasionally, you want to be able to reach them and give a very concise 40-second message. Uh, people don't have, you know, two, three minutes to listen to what you have to say. Um, so you want to prep them why you're calling them, what you're looking to achieve, and you're going to give them a, a follow-up in your, in, your in your discussion. You're going to be able to tell them what they can look for. And that's really, uh, if you can accomplish all of that, that's a successful phone call. Now. If you can't reach them by phone, email is second best. Exactly. What do they need to do with email? Obviously, as Colin mentioned, you need to keep it concise as well. So 40 seconds for a phone call, but for an email, maybe three to four sentences. Obviously, in the, in the subject line, you can include your name and the position that you're, you're looking to, to apply to, for example. And obviously, tailor those three to four sentences. Keep them concise. Make, you, know, you know that this person's getting tons of emails, so you want to be able to stand out. Another important point that I, I'd like to emphasize, and we again uh, encourage all our clients who are looking for work, again, it's difficult when you're outside Canada, uh, focus on outlying cities. Everybody wants to work in the major cities. Of course, Toronto uh, is the major recipient of, of applicants uh, applying for immigration to Canada. Uh, so instead of focusing your efforts on the Toronto or Calgary, Vancouver, Montreal, you'll find the success rate is significantly higher if you're looking for, for, for companies that are really in the outlying areas. What does that imply? Well, it means in some instances, uh, first of all, you're going to find employers who are much more receptive to you. 
Uh, and it means ultimately you're going to be looking at this as a two-step process because if you're not, if you're successful in finding an employer in an outlying area, uh, and and ultimately your goal was to settle in a Toronto or a Vancouver, Montreal, Calgary, Edmonton. Uh, well, you'll be able to do that later on uh, if perhaps the initial position that you 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 are lucky to succeed in. Uh, may not be ultimately where you want to settle. Again, we don't have restrictions in mobility in Canada. No. You can move around uh, without any formality. Right. So you're, for many individuals, the, the pathway to Canada on finding a job from overseas is doing this in a two-step process, meaning focus on the outlying areas. You will see a much different response than if you're contacting employers in the major cities. So uh, you're researching I companies by industry, you're looking for websites, you're looking for companies who are in outlying areas. Go and look at the area code, the telephone numbers, uh, where you'll be able to determine exactly where these companies are located. Um, we like to tell people to visit Canada, yes, right? That makes a big difference. And if they can time their visit to Canada, when you're on the phone with a particular employer, if you could get through to an employer, or if you're if you're uh, you re, you know relegating to a second best email uh, communication, it's always best to try to visit Canada and time your visits to coincide with your employment search. So at least you can be you know you're standing out from others who are applying for a job but you're ba actually saying to an employer, I'm going to be in your area during the week of. This is very impacting, uh, and it, it really makes a difference uh, on the success rate if you can coincide your application, your communications with employers, with an actual planned visit to Canada. Yes. Now, uh, you know, try, try these particular suggestions. You will see it makes a very big difference. Uh, on the overall success rate. Um, there's another interesting uh, strategy that many of our clients can follow, and that's, of course, you've got job fairs in Canada yeah. where you'll have employers. We've been, you know, just last week, we were at a major job fair in Montreal. Uh, we get to, uh, we, we are often requested to attend fairs, and we attended one uh, at one of the local universities here. Uh, it was a really well attended fair, but you'll see job fairs. Uh, employers are on hand looking for uh, potential candidates. So if you can uh, identify the job fairs that are taking place uh, at a, a, during the year, interestingly enough, many of the provinces are conducting job fairs overseas. So take a look at the various provincial sites, take a look at their immigration programs, and you'll see uh, there's a lot of recruitment efforts taking place uh, in Europe, in Asia, in the Philippines, for example. Uh, uh, major job fairs take place there. Obviously, uh, it, it's, it's periodically done during the year. But if you can attend a job fair, which are uh, provincial-sponsored, uh, many employers take part in these um, job fairs uh, at the invitation of a provincial uh, immigration program, so it's, it's sometimes you'll be able to benefit uh, from uh, perfect timing uh, where you're going to actually be able to meet a particular employer. Uh, you know, from a general perspective, the job uh, search process, finding a job from outside Canada, obviously, obviously a difficult task. Um, so, you know, we want to give people general tips in terms of uh, creating daily goals. You know, it's easy to get discouraged. And, you know, you can't expect to find a job on the first go. So this might take uh, hold over many sessions, many hours of work. Um, Persistence? Persistence is, is key. It's very important. I mean, don't give up. You need to just keep sending out your applications. You just need to keep trying. And you need to follow up with employers on a regular basis. So you've got to be very structured, very organized uh, in, in terms of creating daily goals. Uh, once you've set out, uh, you know, you might want to contact many hundreds of employers. 
that you've identified in your industry. Uh, so you want to be able to follow up with those employers. What you don't want to do is just say, uh, I've made these applications, I haven't heard back, I guess there's no jobs available. That would be the most uh, short-sighted uh, and uh, you know, incorrect way of going about the job search. Just because you haven't heard back from a particular employer uh, on, on a positive level doesn't mean there isn't a job available. It means they're either busy or the, the timing isn't right. So it's a question of timing and you need to be persistent in, in maintaining contact. If you can establish an email communication with a particular hiring manager, yes. you know, it may not be uh, uh, opportune when you're contacting, but it, you know, it helps you stand out for later on uh, should you be in a position mm -hmm. to actually visit Canada and then you can follow up. So these are, these are you know, from our point of view, um, it's, it's easy to give up, it's easy to get discouraged, uh, but, you know, being persistent uh, and following up on a regular basis is really, it's crucial. Uh, let's talk to uh, our, our viewers on, on what we do for all of our clients uh, at immigration.ca. Okay, well, uh, so we provide our clients with a Canadian-style resume, a cover letter, as well as a database of at least 500 potential hiring employers in their field. So the the database of potential hiring employers is tailored to each client. So obviously we look at their credential, we, we communicate with our client to see what industries obviously they're interested in as well, and we create a tailor-made database for them. We also include videos, tutorials, tips, and basically we want to help our clients stand out from the crowd. We want them to maximize their chances to come to Canada. That, that's the key, is we really have an effective uh, and, and extensive knowledge and experience in helping you stand out from others who are applying for jobs. Uh, you know, in addition to being what we would consider skilled immigration lawyers uh, and skilled immigration professionals, we're quite knowledgeable and uh, skilled in how to go about finding work in Canada. Uh, we're often working with employers. We get uh, contacted on, on, on a frequent basis by employers who are looking for candidates. Uh, often we're able to match up existing candidates uh, in our uh, database uh, with potential employers. But we're often recruiting, going out and actively looking for employers. So uh, what we're sharing with you today is really what we see as uh, how to maximize your chances and, and really how to stand out uh, you know, we often have employers contacting us and then we're uh, working with candidates to, to really, you know, nail the interview. How do you, how do you nail that interview? Uh, so there's really great tools and, and we've got excellent videos in our uh, products that we share with all our clients. So I think you'll find the material quite useful. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's uh, not a science and uh, you need to have uh, good uh, conditions converging all together uh, in, in, in order to succeed. But overall, I think uh, viewers will find that our products are really insightful and, and in many cases uh, quite useful and successful. Uh, did we did we cover everything? I believe yes, we've covered everything. So, I mean, if you're interested in coming to Canada, please go to our website immigration.ca and complete our free online evaluation form. We'll then get back to you with regards to your options. And obviously, if you want to stay up to date with the latest developments in the Canadian immigration news, you can always follow us and like us on Facebook, Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, and. You can watch our, our we, we do have our previous live streams on uh, our Facebook and our YouTube page if you'd like to watch those as well. So we're, we're going to uh, watch out for uh, the next uh, Express Entry draw, hopefully today, maybe tomorrow. But I would gather to say, surely, uh, another draw this month. Uh, we're going to have our next live stream in approximately two weeks. Uh, stay tuned for that. We'll let everyone know. And, uh, well, oh, that's it. Well, thank you very much. So thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Have a great day and look forward to seeing you again soon.